sound and and see what resonates. That said, um, it's a challenge that I take seriously to um, be mindful of of people uh, for whom this is foreign, and also appreciate that it's not a lot of what's being conveyed might be conveyed without so much of the trappings. Uh, so this is, uh, I take it as an invitation and I ask for both, for, for me uh, and also, um, you know, to wander through this strange land and, and just like, like being in a new wood Oh, what tree is that? You know, <laughs> no harm in a little curiosity and also no requirement. Uh, Zen, this practice is so bare and available and accessible without, you don't have to be a student of Buddhism. Um, you don't have to know anything to sit. It's posture, breathing, stilling the mind. Uh, all the rest is just, you know, uh, this and that effort to pass something on or say something that might, you know, be a little spark, but uh, it's, it's available to everyone. And you don't have to go to school. The school is your cushion. And the teacher, the only real teacher is you. There's just one teacher. Does Zen acknowledge or place an emphasis on the jhanas? Ah. Uh. Yes, um, I mean, I wish Henry were here. <laughs> he would. He he is so well schooled in all of this. It's his um, mental acuity and delight, despite the fact that he's, um, you know, now healing uh, from this. Uh, I mean, he's complaining about his mental acuity. But I bring you greetings, all of you. By the way, I just just talked to him before we started the day before, and he sounded well. Um, but the jhanas is, is something that Henry talks about a lot. You know, that's chan, jhana, just a word for meditation. Um, and that's what Zen comes from. Um, I don't really, I'm not a, a scholar about this. So I would, um, I wish I Googled it now, but I invite you all to. I guess I could say, you know, that's, that's the derivation. Uh, Chan, jhana, zen, uh, this meditation. And uh, something that I really appreciate about Sanbo Zen and even more about Mountain Cloud um, out of, I think this is Henry's uh, compassion and also he, he's seen a need to have as wide a tent as possible for meditative practices. And so this is one reason that he's been really studying. Um, but it should, it's an example in a way that I've been doing this for 30 years and don't really know um, sort of the intric intricacies of this. You know, it's, um, so you, you could go either way. But uh, at Mountain Cloud, we're really starting to investigate and explore uh, different meditative practices. That, they're also connected. They are so connected. So uh, the, the person who asked this question probably knows more than I do about that. Okay. 
I, <clears throat> I find moments of insight are often linked, linked with feelings of lightness and openness, which ultimately pass, giving way to heaviness, which rarely feels illuminating. In this sense, it appears as if insight is tied to the passing of physical phenomena. I find this strange given that the very insight is of the emptiness of all such phenomena. Can you please speak about the nature of insight in light of this experience? <laughs> oh, wonderfully put. Um, you know, insight, vipassana is this tradition that um, also, you know, is, is like the. Uh, the twin with, uh, it goes back to Shakyamuni Buddha and has taken a, a different path, but uh, very near. It's, it's a different style of what you're actually doing when you're sitting. Um, but what, what constitutes insight is not, I don't think, different. Um, really seeing through what we take to be who we are. All of these uh, scaffolding, the stories, the narrative, things even, you know, just this seeing through. And uh, this question sort of describes that, you know, uh, um, One part of it, you know, that's tying this insight into arising, the emptiness of everything that arises, and how that's tied to some phenomena um, in this person's experience. They're, you know, what they're noting calls to mind the last two lines of the Song of the Grass Hut which is if you want to know the undying person, might be if you really want to know the undying person in the grass hut. I know that's enigmatic, undying. Stay very close or don't separate from this skin bag here and now. You know, there is no other emptiness than this. So, of course, you know, you see through um, in your experience. The very thing you're seeing through, you're also <laughs> experiencing. Um, there is this beautiful freedom of seeing already gone, already gone. So we could, you know, yes, I, I once heard it put, you know, there's, there's a rising, there's disappearing, but there's no passing. I mean, it's, it's so wonderful to look into this. Um, and, and we get these tastes sometimes rather powerful rather deeply clarifying of nothing at all. You know, this was this person that I'm very interested in, the work of the 13th century Dogen, so prolific, such a deep experience. Uh, and he has this verse that is quite famous, you know, to study the way is to study the self, all these phenomena. To study the self is to forget the self. That's this great forgetting. I mean, look into it. All these things are happening and no one's doing anything. So then what about 
oh, I have moments of really seeing this, you know, just this one transparency, this boundless, infinite, empty, you know, the word empty sky comes up. Uh, but then it goes away, you know, and that's so light and so wonderful. And, and then it goes away. I mean, one thing that I'll guarantee that goes away <laughs> is the moment we think, oh, so wonderful. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I've used this example before, I think, where I was early on in, in practice, but it was deepening. We were in a zendo here in Dallas, and I remember exactly where I was doing walking meditation. And out of the blue, one step, and the whole world took a step. And then came the thought, the experience like, wow, the whole world just took a step. What was that? <laughs> you know, and, and then suddenly I'm just walking again. That's okay. Um, so I would hold it lightly. And also, you know, this heaviness. Um, look into that. It, you know, many of our hindrances are also gateways. Really, they, they're, that's the portal. But also just what a wonderful invitation, you know, no gain, no loss. Uh, what's it like to be sort of experience these waves without being tossed about? Um, or just have it bring on um, compassion. for yourself, for the experience. I mean, yeah. Um, so I, I uh, really appreciate this question. And um, as the old woman in this wonderful tradition, <laughs> this wise old woman who had a little tea shop at the bottom of uh, this sacred site that was a pilgrimage site for all the monks. So they would come and there was a crossroads, very little, little shop. And the monks would ask for directions and every time, you know, how do I get to this highest peak? Go straight on. So wherever you are, right there. And then the monk or the group of monks would get just past her, but not yet out of your sight. And she'd say, that good, honest monk goes on that way too. Yeah, just helpfully arousing this doubt. What did I do? And with that comes a kind of wonder if doubt can open up into that, not knowing. Yeah, all of that is so, uh, this question just invites that as our experiences do, you know, the, the peaks and the valleys this wonder of not knowing. And yet, yeah, what is this? That question alone, you know, 
is an expression of compassion. If you get soaked in it, if you really just honestly ask, what is this? Are we still in questions? Yeah. Um, could you highlight some of the differences between Sanbo Zen and other lineages? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so originally um, in Mahayana Zen, there are there were five schools, and um, in you know China and um, moving on to Japan. And two of them really endured and actually have, have deep roots now in the West. Um, and that is the Soto School and the Rinzai School. Those are the Japanese names. Um, but that's what they're called here. You know, we haven't renamed them yet. Um, and the Soto school is uh, associated with silent illumination, uh, sometimes called just sitting. Um, the Japanese shikantaza, some people like that word, know it, um, but it's just sitting. And it's, so it's not about koan study, though um, there, there, Dogen was a Soto. You know, he's considered uh, the sort of, in a way, the father the progenitor of uh, Soto in Japan, brought it back from China. Um, and his writing really does take up koans, but in a different way. Uh, the Rinzai school um, is much more about much more focus on this awakening, you know, what you call sudden awakening. Um, both schools uh, are practice awakening, that with a dash, you know, this one thing, practice realization. Both would hone to that, but, but the Rinzai is where the koans come in and, and Rinzai himself, uh, is now, you know, his, his teaching is so much sharper and just, you know, like he is, yeah, it's, it's got a, uh, you know, very direct forceful quality to it. Um, even including, I don't, I don't know anybody who still does this, but, uh, you know, with the stick hitting, hitting the monks and yelling, shouting, and, uh, you know, we might think, well, that's uh, you know, abuse. And in some ways, yeah, it's, it, it, they got abused, uh, you know, for those who, um, for whom it really was helpful, like what fantastic, you know, thank you, master. <laughs> but sorry, this is a bit of a roundabout. Um, Sambo Zen, grew up out of um, an interweaving of those two schools, Soto and Rinzai. So um, it is very open to students who just sit and very open to students who are drawn to koan practice uh, and has been, you know, from the start, it, Sambo Zen has its roots in basically in the late fifties, Yasutani Roshi, the three pillars of Zen is a classic of Sanbo Zen. Um, and if you read that, especially the first 90 pages, um, it's like this really interesting introduction. And you also have, you know, you immediately, it, I hope, realize this is a, you, a lens, a view into this, um, you know, Japanese certain era in uh, Japanese Zen practice that was incredibly fertile and and um, many westerners went there and uh, have now come back and and it's becoming you know a new thing uh, it, it's yet to be seen it's young in the west um, then there are there are all these other schools of meditation uh, 
You know, I noticed there was a question from, from the Insight School, Vipassana School. Um, they're, you know, Korean. Um, there, there's so many different meditative traditions. But Sambo Zen can be uh, most best understood, I think, as a combination of Soto and Rinzai. Okay. Um, <clears throat> are we recording the talk? Thank you. Um, I see a recording uh, button. So I believe right now this is being recorded. I, I wasn't aware, so I don't know. Um, I think the intention has been that the uh, morning talks for sure have been recorded, but I haven't actually noticed. So um, Johanna will know if anyone is interested. Um, if they are recorded, um, one reason I don't know is that Mountain Cloud is switching to a kind of live stream. And we just um, tried that out just a couple weeks ago for the first time. So uh, I guess we did it in the winter solstice retreat for the first time. So the signals on my screen are different and I don't, I don't know. Okay. Um, is the stilling of the mind for its own sake or for something else? Mm. Well, the question, um, you know, there's a, it, it, where I went with that was, well, there's, there's nothing, it's all, everything is for the sake of itself. Um, the, you know, the, if we have some gaining idea, that's not so helpful. Um, this is the question that comes up when people ask, why do you sit? And it's sort of a trick question because if you have much contact with Zen, you know that, you know, I sit because, or I sit in order to dot, dot, dot is, you know, not considered um, such a fitting response. Um, we sit to sit, you hear that. Um, I mean, I'm so very grateful for this practice and I actually, believe that um, it's an expression of awakening and that it affects the whole world. I don't know. Uh, stilling the mind um, is, is one leg of these three, you know, posture, breathing, stilling the mind. And I think the best answer is to experience that, you know, as it gets more still, what opens up. Uh, uh, Henry's called it a tenderizer. You know, I've called it uh, a solvent. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful thing to do. Um, but again, I'm not, you know, I, I, I sit because I feel like, um, well, I want to. <laughs> I'm compelled to. Uh, and sometimes sitting isn't uh, the stilling the mind aspect of sitting is rather elusive, more, more so than others. Uh, but oh, when it comes, when you settle in, uh, this uh, sense of peace and openness and wonder um, that the artifice 
of boundary that we imagine, it's just not there. So I think that's a question more to explore when, you know, what's it like for you? Uh, it, it calls to mind a story I love, again, from the masters. Um, but this one is kind of fun, accessible, where the the master who um, compiled the Mumon Khan, the Gateless Gate, that collection, very famous collection of koans, and uh, put the koan Mu first in that, out of the power of his own experience, sitting with that simple word, Mu. Uh, so there's a story about him. He's obviously, he's a priest, you know, and there was a drought, it's my favorite story. Um, and the, you know, governor of that region comes and says, please come do your priestly duties, help us in this drought. And Mumon goes there and sits in the temple. And, you know, some time goes by and this magistrate comes in and he's just sitting there in Zazen, in silent sitting. You know, he would be on a cushion on the floor, on a tatami, you know, just sitting. Probably very still. And the magistrate says, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, we need your help. Do your stuff. And Mumon says, silently not influencing anything. You know, I don't know why, but that touches me. It just touches the heart. And I think that uh, that comes from some taste of that stillness. It's, a, it's such a sense of wonder in the experience of being still. I, as I said, I think it's transformative, but if we sit in order for something somehow that tends to make the water more choppy. So just wander into the center of the circle of wonder. And I love for the person who asked this question to circle back, um, just to hear how practice, how it unfolds. Okay, we have one more question. Do we have time for one more? Um, I think we better, um, if you could, um, I'll just take it down and um, if I can respond privately, I will, or maybe it'll be the first question at the next intro retreat. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you all so much. Yes, and let's um, have a sit now up until just before 3.30 about 3.30. Maybe take one minute to stand up and stretch and find your cushion. Thank you all. Thank you, Mary Ann. <laughs>